A listener's note before we begin. The following episode contains adult themes and content of a violent nature. It may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. At 10.21 a.m. on Sunday, April 19th, a man ran into the fire hall in Lower Onslow, Nova Scotia, shouting, Shots fired! Shots fired! Bullets flew through the air. Some tore holes in the big bay doors. One punctured the glass of a fire truck's windshield. A firefighter dashed from the garage into the meeting area on the other side of the hall. He and three other men took cover, throwing tables on their sides as a vertical line of shrapnel sprayed up the side of the building. In an instant, a safe space had become like a war zone. Outside, an RCMP officer who was hiding behind his car stood and threw his hands up in surrender and then ducked back down behind the cruiser. When the shooting stopped, four men inside the fire hall crouched in place in terrified silence. They knew police were looking for a gunman that morning. There'd been a shooting 28 kilometers down the road in Portapic the night before, and people had been killed. One of the men at the fire hall had lived through it. But what these men didn't know is that Gabriel Wortman wasn't the man behind the trigger. On that day, we were terrorized for one hour by the RCMP in the middle of the worst mass shooting in Canadian history in the middle of a pandemic. I'm your host, Sarah Ritchie, and this is 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre, Episode 10, Friendly Fire. By 10.07 a.m., The horror of this mass killing had been going on for more than 12 hours. Gabriel Wortman had murdered 19 people. The RCMP spent Saturday night at the first scene in Portapic where 13 people were killed. The gunmen spent the night, as far as we're aware, in DeBert, hiding out. And with daylight, he was on the move. First, he drove north to Wentworth and targeted Sean McLeod and Alana Jenkins. Then he killed Tom Bagley, who tried to help after seeing their house on fire. Next, he murdered Lillian Campbell as she walked on the side of Highway 4, an apparently random encounter as he headed south to the home of another couple he knew near Glenholm. There, he somehow slipped by the police, who thought he was pinned down for a second time. He went back to DeBert, where he killed Kristen Beaton and Heather O'Brien, before driving through Lower Onslow he drove right by the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade at 10.07 a.m. He didn't stop. He covered nearly 100 kilometers and took six lives in just over four hours that morning. Each incident prompted panicked 911 calls as the police tried to catch up. And remember, he was disguised as one of them, and the public did not know. His mock police car no doubt created confusion with the other RCMP vehicles on the road. What happened at the fire hall in Lower Onslow is perhaps the clearest example of just how chaotic that Sunday morning was. And a lot of it was caught on surveillance video. At around 7.20 that morning, Greg Muse got a call from the Colchester County Emergency Management Office, or EMO. Greg is the volunteer fire chief for the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade. He's been a volunteer firefighter for 40 years. He was joined by Deputy Chief Daryl Curry, who's been with the fire service for almost 25 years. The brigade is made up of about 40 volunteer firefighters. They have other jobs. They're not paid anything to be on call. Daryl said he can easily volunteer up to 800 hours of his time each year to firefighting duties. The Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade covers 225 square kilometers. In 2019, they responded to around 200 calls. And it's not just fires. About a quarter of their typical calls are car crashes. And before the pandemic, most were actually for medical emergencies. It's a tough job, and it requires a lot of training. Volunteer firefighters are essential first responders, especially in rural communities. EMO was calling Greg that Sunday morning to see if he could open the fire hall as an evacuation center for people from Portapic. It was supposed to be a place for evacuees to rest, 
to get help finding a place to stay or anything else they may need through the Red Cross. The fire hall is right on Highway 2, about a 25-minute drive east of port well away from the scene there. It's a long, one-story white building that's essentially split into three parts. The main fire hall, the entrance area, and the meeting hall. If you're looking at it from the road, it's set back in a large parking lot. To the left is the fire hall itself with a garage door and three bay doors for the fire trucks under a peaked roof. The entranceway is the middle section of the building, set back a little further, with a main door that connects the garage to the left with the meeting area through a door to the right. Greg and Daryl set up the hall together that morning. They pulled an accordion partition across the meeting area, splitting the room in two. They were trying to keep part of the room sectioned off because of COVID-19. And, and we, we were only here to sort of open the doors and just, you know, be a presence. Not We weren't here to register evacuees. That was being left with the EMO and RCMP. So Greg and I were doing some paperwork because we had a fire the night before and just stuck around the hall for the, for the first bit. They had responded to a fire call the previous night that had nothing to do with the shootings. And as they did their paperwork, an RCMP officer arrived just after 8.30 a.m. He was stationed at the fire hall that entire morning as security and spent most of the time outside at his cruiser. Daryl and Greg were told very little about the ongoing killing spree. They'd been following what was happening on social media, so for the most part, they knew what everyone else knew, and they didn't suspect they were in danger. Daryl managed to see a picture of the gunman before the RCMP tweeted it at 8.54 a.m. The RCMP officer did show us a picture prior to going on Twitter, and I guess it was... In case he showed up. In hindsight now, I know why the RCMP were here. At, at the time, it seemed odd that you had an evacuation center set up with RCMP security. Again, I, I knew there was something going on locally in port just because of uh, like social media posts early in the morning. Obviously, had I known some details, I would never left to come here, and my wife would have never left to go to work that morning. At around 9 o'clock, the first port pick evacuees arrived, but they decided not to stay. They headed to Truro to get some food and coffee. We've learned that the next evacuee to arrive at the fire hall that morning was Richard Ellison. You may remember his name. Richard's two sons were visiting him in port pick that weekend, and Corey was among the first people to be killed. His other son, Clinton, hid in the woods for hours on Saturday night while the RCMP searched for him. We know from the recordings of police radio chatter that night that Richard called 911 after Clinton called him to tell him that Corey had been shot. Richard told the dispatcher his son was still hiding in the woods, too scared to move after finding his brother lying in the road. It was around 2.30 a.m. that Clinton was picked up by the RCMP and taken to Great Village and then on to the hospital to be treated for hypothermia. Richard, who stayed hidden at home that night, was later taken out of port pick Police brought him to the fire hall in Lower Onslow sometime around 10 a.m. At 10.21 a.m., the RCMP tweeted another update. It said, quote, Gabriel Wartman is currently in the central onslow Debert area in a vehicle that may resemble what appears to be an RCMP vehicle and may be wearing what appears to be an RCMP uniform. Please stay inside and avoid the area. Central Onslow is five kilometers east of the fire hall. DeBert is in the other direction, just shy of 10 kilometers northwest. Richard and Greg were in the meeting area of the fire hall at the same time, 1021. Daryl was over near the truck bays. At her house across the street, Sharon McClellan was making coffee, talking on the phone with her sister. She woke me up and, and asked me if I knew anything about what was going on in port pick And I said, no, what's going on? So she started telling me a little bit. You know, it was scary, but I didn't think it was anything that was right around my neighborhood. Sharon's kitchen window looks out at the fire hall with a clear view of the entire parking lot and of Highway 2. 
I'm looking across there and I see um, a cop car, uh, RCMP car, and another man standing there talking. And there's a, I don't know, three or four other vehicles in the parking lot. The emergency management office coordinator was in the parking lot. He was wearing a yellow reflective safety vest. Sharon said he was standing with the RCMP officer beside his fully marked cruiser, which was parked in front of that main entrance with its front bumper facing the highway. The Mountie was wearing a full uniform. Across the street from Sharon, Joy and Pat McCabe were about to have breakfast. Their light blue house is right next door to the fire hall. It's separated by two narrow driveways and a strip of grass. There's no fence in between the properties. I talked with Pat in August, and he said Joy was struggling with what she witnessed, and she didn't want to talk. Well, I was laying down reading a book, and the wife was cooking breakfast out in the kitchen. And the uh, side of the house there, it faces the, the fire hall yard. Anyway, I heard shots, and then the wife started screaming. And she was looking out the window. When Pat and I met, we stood in his yard looking over at the hall. I've stood below that kitchen window, and you can see across to the far side of the parking lot and out to the highway beyond. On the morning of Sunday, April 19th, Sharon just happened to be looking out her window across the road when... A car pulled up. It was a gray four-door Hyundai. It stopped. The two doors swung open. Two people ran towards the fire hall. One went in the ditch. One went behind the um, garbage bin. And they just opened fire. Meanwhile, from her window, Joy McCabe watched in horror. And she saw this car, an unmarked car, pull up in the middle of the road over there. Two people got out, one on each side of the car, left the doors open, and they started shooting from the road. These two shooters were west of the fire hall, firing at the two men in the parking lot. Bullets hit the truck bays and a stone monument that honors members of the fire service who've died. Shrapnel from that impact tore holes in the outside wall of the meeting area. The shots lasted a matter of seconds. And when she looked out the window, she saw the two guys shooting, and she saw a guy crouched down behind a couple cars here. And uh, so she hollered to me, and I come out, and I look, and I see the, the two people that jumped the ditch, and they were by the garbage bin. And when I come out and looked out the window, she was screaming at me to get down, but curious. And the two guys get up, and they're carrying assault rifles, walking across the parking lot yard. The neighbors didn't know right away that the men who were shooting were RCMP officers. The Onslow Fire Hall has motion-sensitive surveillance cameras all around the outside. One mounted above the garage doors faces the main entrance, and it captures almost the entire parking lot, except for the far western corner where the shooters came from. Sharon and Pat both said the unmarked car stopped on the two-lane highway just west of the fire hall, just out of range of the cameras. So there's no video of the car stopping or of the two RCMP officers crouching to shoot at the hall. But here's what was captured by the cameras, and the times are down to the second. At 10.21.37, the front outside camera captured the EMO coordinator running for the safety of the fire hall. This is when Daryl and Greg say the shooting began. I heard the shots and the EMO guy come barely in, in the door. With, you know, he was yelling something like, shots fired. A camera inside the main doors caught the moment the EMO coordinator ducked into the fire hall. He barely stopped to pick up a portable radio from the ground and then kept running out of frame. Daryl dove through that main entrance area at almost the same time. The pair sprinted into the meeting area where Richard and Greg were taking cover. At that time, we all took running, uh, ran into another room, and we started flipping tables over. Uh, I don't know what the tables would have done for us, but we're seeing him in line. We got to hide somewhere. Outside, the Mountie, who was stationed at the fire hall, ducked behind his cruiser. We're not exactly sure why the two officers opened fire. We know police were looking for the gunman who was driving a marked cruiser, who was wearing a police uniform, and had a reflective vest. 
It seems that these RCMP officers saw the marked cruiser in front of the fire hall and saw someone wearing a reflective vest and thought they had their man. 18 seconds after the EMO coordinator ran for the building, the Mountie stood and put his hands up, his head and arms visible over the cruiser's windshield for about seven seconds. Then he hid again. The the cop that was stationed there, he was just standing there with his hands, waving his hands, you know, as if, don't shoot, don't shoot. And a couple seconds, they got up after shooting. They got up, walked towards the stationed officer. And that's when I realized that they had the safety vest on with the police on the back. So that's when I realized they were the police. At first, Sharon across the street had no idea who was doing the shooting or who they were shooting at. I didn't know it was the RCMP. Why would they do that? You know, I mean, just get out of a vehicle and start shooting. Take position and start shooting with rifles. Like, they were long guns. They weren't like little pistols. They were long guns. It was petrifying. Petrifying. The surveillance video shows that at 10.22.10, 35 seconds after the shooting started, the stationed RCMP officer who was hiding behind his cruiser stood back up. About a minute later, he walked around the cruiser toward the building, but he didn't go inside. A minute and 35 seconds after the shooting began, the first shooter walked into frame from the western side of the parking lot. We'll call him Shooter 1. In the video, you can see he's bald and wearing a full RCMP uniform and what looks like body armor. He walked upright with a carbine, a long-barreled semi-automatic firearm, in his right hand, pointed at the ground. He was not at all in a defensive position, and he wasn't running across the parking lot. Instead, he approached the RCMP officer that he and his partner had just been shooting at. In the video, you can see the two appear to have a conversation. Then they walked together toward the building. They approached the main entrance area, and the stationed officer gestured toward the wall that's full of holes. Shooter 1 went around the front of the meeting hall as the stationed officer went back to his cruiser. According to the video, the time was 10.23.54 a.m. Inside the fire hall, the four men hiding behind overturned tables and stacks of metal chairs were terrified. In the chaos, they didn't even hear how many shots had been fired. And again, one of them, Richard, had survived the horror in Portapique the night before. As far as they knew, the gunman was on the property. There was a lot of banging on, on one of our doors, side doors, where we the room was in. I think that more or less was the worst part of my feeling because I thought he was going to get in the door and that's it. I'd say he probably banged on at least four or five times <laughs> and heard names. And never once said it was RCMP or whatever. There was no name. Nobody said anything. And it was kind of a scary moment for all four of us in there, I guess. They didn't know if the RCMP officer stationed outside was okay. At 10.23.30, just shy of two minutes after the shooting began, The surveillance cameras capture Shooter 2 making a sweep of the property. As his partner tried to get inside those side doors, he walked into the parking lot and around the western side of the fire hall. He also looks to be wearing a full uniform, body armor, and a knitted hat. And like his partner, he doesn't appear to be in a defensive stance. His carbine is in his right hand, pointed at the ground. Sometimes as he walked, he held it briefly with both hands. Shooter 2 did a complete loop around the back of the building. He walked at a quick pace but never ran. He looked left and right from time to time, but he never stopped. He didn't appear to check behind the sheds or the oil tank or the shipping containers in the yard. He walked right next to Pat McCabe's house as he came back around the front of the building. Shooter 2 didn't walk over to Pat's yard to look in his sheds or in the two camper trailers in his driveway and he never approached the house where Pat was watching from the window while his wife was hiding. According to the surveillance video, that entire loop took 52 seconds. At 10.24, two minutes and 24 seconds after the first shots were fired, the RCMP officer who was stationed at the hall and Shooter 1 walked inside the front entrance. 
The stationed Mountie led the way as they walked out of frame of that camera toward the meeting hall. Inside, the EMO coordinator and Richard Ellison were hiding together near the far wall, close to the opening of that accordion wall that divided the room. Daryl and Greg were hiding in separate places behind the accordion wall, with toppled furniture all over the place. Daryl said he heard someone call out. I never spoke to either one of them, I guess it was the EMO just answered. The only question was, is everybody okay? The EMO coordinator answered when the Mounties asked if everyone was okay, but Daryl and Greg weren't part of that exchange and they really had no idea what was going on. They said no one came to look inside the room where they were. Nobody identified themselves to us no. as police. Nobody identified themselves out loud as police. The firefighters couldn't see who had come inside. On the surveillance video, it's clear that Shooter 1 barely left that main entrance. He walked in the door at 10.24. Six seconds later, he was still on the edge of the frame of that camera. He disappeared for about 10 seconds, and then he walked back outside, 18 seconds after entering the building. The Mountie who was shot at was inside the hall for 30 seconds. He walked through the main entrance area at 10.24.03 and was back within view of the camera 25 seconds later. So the police officers didn't stay inside for very long at all. What you need to understand is that the men inside had no idea who was shooting at them. And while they were physically okay, for all they knew, the gunman just tried to kill them and he was still there. Outside the fire hall, the two shooters met up in the parking lot out front. At 10.24.34, the video captured them walking back across the lot, and 17 seconds later, they were out of frame. They were on the property within view of the cameras for 1 minute, 39 seconds. And they walked back to the car that was still sitting in the middle of the road with the doors wide open, and get in their car and left went towards Truro. Sharon couldn't make sense of what she was seeing. I ran to my back bedroom and hollered for my husband because he was up in the garage. And I just, I was just panicking. I was on the phone with my sister and just, you know, telling her they're shooting, they're shooting. Like, what do I do? And she's screaming at me to lock the doors. And, you know, so I just, I panicked. I didn't know what to do. Like, what, what do you do? You know, I just, I just, I just panicked. Inside the fire hall, no one knew it was over. So they stayed hidden. They didn't dare talk to one another. They were afraid to make any noise. We were trying to be quiet. Just we didn't really want to know we was in that room. And, uh, I never it was quiet for quite a while. Yeah. Time passed and no one came for them. No one came to check if they were shot. No one came to tell them it was all clear. The surveillance video shows that outside, the Mountie who was stationed at the fire hall moved his car at 10.46 a.m. He drove it away from the main entrance over to the side of the building, out of view of the road and the people inside the fire hall. Then he stayed in the cruiser. The EMO coordinator had access to that portable radio, but he couldn't communicate with the RCMP because they were on encrypted channels. In the silence of the room that morning, the men didn't think to call 911. Everything was happening so fast. I, I think our biggest fear was just to find a place to hide. My only theory is that we already had the resources here that we're going to show up if we call. So why would we call when they're already here? It's like if your house is on fire and the fire department's parked in front of your house, you're probably not going to call 911. You're just going to have to put the fire in. Over the next half an hour, Daryl and Greg were able to check the RCMP Twitter account for updates. Finally, two tweets came out at 11.04 and 11.06 a.m., both said the gunman was heading south on Highway 102 near Brookfield, which is 22 kilometers away from the fire hall. By the time the next tweet or two came out that he was further away, we eventually made our way out into the truck bay area where we have glass 
There's windows we can see out front. It became clear just how close they came to being shot. And Bill mentioned about a crack in the windshield and my truck, and I said, yeah, I should look at that. So, somebody mentioned that to me. So, so when we turned around up to the truck, and I said, geez, somebody should have told me there was a hole in it. It was a fresh bullet hole in the windshield of one of the trucks. There was another in a side door. A bullet was found later lodged in the engine. Just moments before the shooting began, Daryl walked the three steps from that truck bay into the radio communication room. After we locked and we could see where the two bullet holes come to our door, he said, oh my God, and he wasn't that far away from the room that where he went through the radio room. They looked through the windows into the parking lot and saw that the Mountie who was stationed at the fire hall didn't appear to be there anymore. So we were then on our own. We just, I personally, I can't say we, I guess, I assumed that that was the shooter and our cop took off after him or he stole the car. There was nobody in our yard, in that parking lot. So we were here alone after being shot. But at least they were beginning to feel like they weren't in immediate danger. I was just so happy to be alive. Yeah. Like it's at that point, um, we, we, everything we knew, we survived the shooter, right? Like not too many did. It was probably the, probably the, the absolute, year. the absolute worst moment of my life. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. My too. Like it's. Daryl and Greg said the time they spent waiting felt like an eternity. It was an hour. Yeah. It was an hour we were here. The shots started just after 10.21 a.m. At 11.18 a.m., the EMO coordinator who was taking cover inside the hall saw that the first port pick evacuees drove back into the parking lot. He ventured out to talk to them and found them parked next to the Mountie in his cruiser by the side of the fire hall. The surveillance video shows that he had a conversation with the people in the vehicles. And then he went back inside and told the others that the shooting was actually friendly fire. Greg said the RCMP officer never came back inside. They don't know why he didn't tell them it was safe to come out for that whole hour. No. I have to ask him. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would have helped me and Daryl and the other two people who were there. And, uh, but believing this for an hour and, and there, uh, there, like it just didn't make sense. And we work with these guys every day, other on calls, and, and uh, our relationships are good with them. Uh, it still bothers me why he didn't come in and tell us what happened. Remember, these men are all first responders, so it's possible that one day they could be at a call together, and Daryl and Greg may have to work alongside the officers who shot at them. A little later that morning, when they heard the gunman had been caught, Daryl and Greg walked outside their fire hall into an eerie quiet, and they looked at all the damage. Uh, I don't know how many shots was fired, but uh, our side of our wall was shot up, uh, right from the bottom to the top of the roof, up to the top of the eave. One bullet hit that monument. It's not clear if any of the bullets directly hit the building next to it or if the holes in the wall that Greg mentioned were caused by shrapnel. Two went through the garage doors, and a bullet also tore straight through the top of an electronic sign on the opposite end of the property, near the ditch where the shooters were set up. It was scary for me. Yeah. yeah. What, what could have happened? You know, there were two people outside that could have been dead. Fortunately, the shooters were not a good shot. I can't imagine if one of them had a big hit. That just would make it so much worse than it already is. And it wouldn't matter whether it was the cop or the other person or, or you know, Pat and his wife were right, straight in the line of fire in their house. Pat McCabe came over from his house next door to take a look at the damage, too. Some of those marks were still visible when he showed me around months later. In August, he said his wife was still having a tough time with the memories of that morning. Well, it was terrifying to her. I believe she's suffering. She's having trauma from it now. And then, you know, and then any time there's a backfire or anything, the wife goes in a panic and, you know, well, what was that noise, you know? 
Sharon agreed it's been difficult to move past what happened. I see a cop and, you know, my stomach comes up my throat. I just, I panic. I panic. You know, and sometimes the RCMP will drive by my house and they'll stop into the fire hall. And they'll just sit there for whatever reason. I don't know if it's just, you know, a spot for them to stop and take notes or whatever. But they're there. And that's a reminder for me. It scares the hell out of me. It really does. Pat said he wants an explanation. I just have like to have clarification is, you know, what the heck they were shooting at. More than 10 months later, that's still a mystery. Nova Scotia's independent police watchdog, the Serious Incident Response Team, or CERT, began its investigation right away, interviewing Sharon McClellan at around 6 that Sunday evening. The surveillance video shows investigators were at the fire hall that evening as well. In the days after the shootings, CERT said it was investigating what it called, quote, the discharge of firearms by two RCMP officers, end quote. CERT said in a statement to Global News that, quote, we don't know what they were shooting at. We do know that the shooter was not in the area at that time, end quote. The RCMP won't talk about what happened because CERT is investigating. This is what Superintendent Darren Campbell said on April 24th when he was asked about the fire hall shooting. What I can do is I can provide you with some general comments, uh, obviously things that um, um, are, are known to us and that caused us to engage CERT uh, in taking care of that particular investigation. What I think it may be helpful is to uh, put into context the timing of that incident. And of course, the officers on the road uh, knew that we were looking for a marked police vehicle. And it, uh, it was two of our other officers uh, that were involved in that incident. Uh, and it also involved a marked vehicle. But I can't go any further than that as it's currently under investigation. The director of CERT is a former judge named Felix Caccione. He leads two civilian investigators who are retired RCMP members and one current member of the RCMP and one of the Halifax Regional Police. Those police officers report only to Felix during their term. In December, he told me that the investigator in charge of this file had to return to active duty with the Halifax Regional Police, and the new investigator needed time to get caught up. He also said they were waiting on some final reports. There are no rules for how long investigators have to complete their work. By law, once the investigation is over, the director has three months to release a summary report to the public. The investigation must also determine whether any police officer should face criminal charges. Back in April, the RCMP said there would be an internal review of the officer's actions too, but they haven't said what the result is. So in the course of any of those types of referrals to CERT, uh, when there's a discharge of firearm, there's always a review, and there's always a review of the status of those officers. At the time of this recording, the CERT investigation still isn't done. I spoke with Felix again as we got ready to release this episode, and he said he has nearly finished his summary report. Daryl and Greg said CERT didn't ask them many questions, and they said they haven't received much information about the investigation in the months since it happened. Absolutely nothing. I, I know that the CERT website says, uh, you know, they have liaisons who are supposed to keep those involved, informed of what's going on. I, I did get one phone call saying that the investigator was being replaced. The new one. He said they've learned more through other sources. I have got updates from reporters who probably carry a bigger stick with CERT than I do. I got a couple updates there. That's all we've heard. These two RCMP officers came dangerously close to shooting a fellow Mountie, other first responders, a victim of this tragedy, and bystanders. It's something former cop Michael Arntfield finds totally baffling. He's a criminology professor at Western University in London, Ontario, and we heard from him back in episode five. It's a completely unreasonable uh, act, so there is no reasonable explanation that can be uh, attached to it. Michael said the silence about what happened is also concerning. When you have two officers pull off amid a manhunt following the worst massacre and rampage in Canadian history, and their, their option is to 
uh, fire rounds into an empty building, what they think is an empty building actually has evacuees inside it. Um, that's not a response that anywhere else in this country would uh, still be unanswered months later. There's no question that RCMP officers who were responding that weekend were dealing with an extremely difficult situation. This was an incredibly stressful weekend, an unprecedented mass killing that was happening over a huge area. But Michael said training needs to change. He likened it to the way that police preparedness was redefined after the mass shooting at Columbine High School in the United States. No one thought in the in the late 90s or that you know we would need to train regular uh, frontline patrol officers for deploying to a school where the the sprinkler system's going off, you, the lights are off, uh, there's explosives and, uh, and 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 two armed suspects. So that made that a reality. That incident made that a reality, and then training was adjusted to account for that. Again, no one would have expected amid a pandemic when everyone is home and sitting ducks that you would have someone disguised as a police officer. Um, going to people's homes and committing home invasion massacres and then burning down the buildings. I mean, in a, in a sparsely um, populated area with an equally sparsely uh, populated police department or uh, detachment. So naturally there were errors. This will change the conversation, I think, in terms of uh, how training needs to be conducted. Sharon McClellan is hoping that happens. I don't want them to lose their job, but I do want them to be trained so if this happens again, some innocent bystander doesn't get shot. She and her husband went over to the fire hall that Sunday afternoon, and they spoke with the Mountie who was stationed there. She wanted to know what happened. He said that um, he wasn't even supposed to go to work that day, that it was his day off. And his little guy said to him the morning, he said, don't go to work today, daddy. And he said, I'll be home for you now, buddy. You know, and he said, all I want to do right now is go home and be with my family. And they left him there. He didn't get to go home and be with his family at that moment. Nobody came in and and covered for him or anything. He had to sit there. In the months since, Greg and Daryl have wondered, were these officers overtired and making poor decisions? Was this the result of a critical communication breakdown? Nothing seems like it followed policy. I don't I don't know how the RCMP works, but. Um, in that sense, but it would be nice to know what should have been done. And I guess, you know, the big thing is, are they going to learn from it? Um, We did, but it it seems like it's, it seems like everything is being shoved under the rug. The firefighters have never been told the names of the officers who shot at them that morning. They haven't had much contact with the RCMP other than their usual coordination on emergency calls. Three RCMP members came to the hall not long after the shooting to assess the damage and to meet with them. And what about an apology at that time? Was there an apology? A what? <laughs> <laughs> they asked, right, how we were doing. And, and we told them. So I, I think there was, a, there was an acknowledgement that it was a traumatic event in a, in a roundabout way, I think. In a press conference on June 4th, 2020, RCMP Chief Superintendent Chris Leather talked about the meeting at the fire hall. There's something I'll add about Onslow because what took place on April 19th, as the incident was unfolding and was traumatic for those that were there. Since then, I, along with local RCMP commanders from the area, met with the chief and deputy of the Onslow Fire Brigade to hear firsthand what people had experienced on the 19th. We had a very respectful and honest conversation. And as partners, we made a commitment to continue to work shoulder to shoulder in our shared responsibility of public safety. We asked the RCMP if they apologized or explained what happened to the firefighters. And I'll read you their reply. Quote, Our criminal operations officer has met with members of the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade in light of the distress the incident on April 19th may have caused. Our CMP has paid for damages to the Onslow Fire Hall, repairs to a fire truck, and an electronic sign that was damaged as a result of the incident, end quote. 
Repairs to the fire truck, the exterior walls, and the electronic sign cost about $42,000. As for the monument, it would have cost about $1,500 to fix the bullet chip and have it re-stenciled. The mark was buffed out for the most part when another name was added, but it's still there. The acknowledgement that they've done something wrong, in my opinion, is the fact that they've paid for all the damage. No one died in Onslow that morning. No one was physically hurt. But people living in the neighborhood and the men who were at the fire hall that day lived through a trauma too. I remember thinking when I was in there, how am I going to die? Is it going to be fast? Is it, am I going to, am I going to see this person? Uh, am I going to lay bleeding on the floor? I, I remember thinking that to myself in there, like, how am I going to die here? Because I assumed I was going to. Greg and Daryl have felt isolated since this happened. They have each other to lean on and their partners, but they said other supports have been lacking. They both tried talking with counselors appointed through the volunteer fire service. I couldn't get everything out of like I wanted to get out, like on on a talk session. Like we did it on phone because of COVID. I've seen like I I only get to say one thing and we stick that one thing all all whole hour. My wife helps me more. Just I can tell her everything, uh, and she'll ask me questions about it. Daryl tried several sessions too, but he said it felt like they missed the mark. I don't think people understand the, the seriousness of or how close somebody was to dying that day. Uh, it just they, they they don't seem I, the counselor people I talked to just didn't don't seem to understand. They they haven't seen the video, so. Greg said the emergency management office is trying to arrange for them to see psychologists 10 months after the fact. Greg and Daryl have been volunteer firefighters for decades. Seeing tragedy and witnessing trauma is a harsh reality of the job as first responders. But when it happens to you, Daryl said, it's different. Some days are good, some days aren't. I never slept last night, so some days aren't good, they just not. Uh, You know, it's the trouble focusing, it's no no ambition, like, to move past it. Experiencing trauma is different than witnessing trauma. You know, to to go to a fire, somebody dies, or you you pull a body out of a house or a car accident, that's, we were just there as witnesses. We weren't here as witnesses. We were here and experienced it. They've had a lot of support from the other members of the fire service and beyond. Greg said other firefighters will call and ask how they're really doing to make sure they know people care. While that can be a painful reminder, it's nice to feel like people haven't forgotten. But Daryl said he hasn't always had the same experience. Sometimes I feel like I have a plague. Really? Yeah. And it's sort of the opposite of, of what it seems like. Nobody, everybody's scared to ask you how you're doing in case you answer. He feels like most people can't understand what they've been through. They don't always know how to ask about it, and there's not much anyone can say to make it better. That's the fine knife edge that, that people are on, right? Like, is he going to break down and start crying or... Is he going to say everything is fine? Oh, yeah, I'm doing, doing good, right? Uh, that's, I think people walk that that edge and they just never know which way you're going to tip. So it's just as easy to avoid it. The only thing they feel will help now is time and more urgently, answers. I mean, they put us to hell, I'm going to say the word, that day. And I think we need an explanation. And it should have been done months ago. Like I, I think we should have, they should have come here and, and met with us and, and give us a reason what happened that day. And it made, made us feel a little bit better, but as of right now, I don't feel any better about giving this happens. Coming back to the fire hall brings back these memories. 
this used to be my second home and I kind of uh kind of isn't like now like well I shouldn't say it isn't right now but I don't feel it is because I used to live here one time I mean back and forth every day and it's just not the same it, it don't feel the same I thought this was the same song like I mean Firehouse was safe songs for us I mean I, I think this place is a safe song for anybody that comes there and and uh, if I didn't know this was going on, it was, I don't know if I would have known. Had we known the, the true gravity of the whole situation, well, I know Greg wouldn't have opened the hall, and I never would have left home. The trauma doesn't just go away because the rest of the world has moved on. The fire hall itself is pretty much patched up. From the outside, it looks like things are back to normal, even if it doesn't feel that way. And when the next call comes in, Daryl and Greg will be there. We're still here for the community. They know that. Um, lots of support. Uh, we continue to be professional and uh, you know work with all our partners that we work with. And, uh, don't have any plan to change that. It's, that's just the way we are. We already told you the gunman drove past Lower Onslow at 10.07 a.m., he drove on to Truro, the largest town in the area. In surveillance images released by the RCMP after the shootings, we can see that he didn't try to hide or avoid being seen. At 10.16, he went by the Dairy Queen on Walker Street. A minute later, the camera captured him driving by a barber shop on the same street. The still image shows two people walking on the sidewalk as his mock RCMP cruiser passed by just feet away. He drove by shops and businesses and people on a sleepy Sunday morning. But he didn't stop. He was just passing through. By 10.19 a.m., he turned onto Willow Street, Highway 2, heading south, out of town, about to cross paths with two RCMP officers. It's with tremendous sadness that I share with you that we have lost Constable Heidi Stevenson, a 23-year 20 year veteran of the force, who was killed this morning while responding to an active shooter incident. Heidi answered the call of duty and lost her life while protecting those she served. That's next time on 13 Hours. Thank you so much for joining us this week. 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre is written and produced by me, Sarah Ritchie, and Alex Kress. Our story producer is Dila Velasquez. Sound design and audio production by Rob Johnston. Editing assistance from Neil Benedict. Additional reporting for this episode by Global News investigative reporter Brian Hill. Special thanks to Mike D'Souza, managing editor for the Global News investigative unit. I'd love to have you tell a friend about this podcast, and you can help me share these important stories by rating and reviewing 13 Hours on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We have much more on our website, including articles, maps, and photos. All of that written and curated by Brian Hill, Alex Kress, and me. Just head to globalnews.ca slash 13 hours. You can also find us on Instagram at 13 hours podcast. And if you have a question about this episode or series, please get in touch on social media or by email at 13 hours at curiouscast.ca. I'd love to hear from you. Our contact information is in the show notes, too. Thanks again for listening. Please join me next time.